How you guys doing? Chris Ignato here and you are watching Nature Here and Now. <laughs> so, you know, I decided to go for a bit of a walk today because it's like early April and it's 81 degrees. It's a warm day. And uh, I got lured down here because you can hear all those American toads singing loud and clear in this wetlands habitat. But to start the video off, I want to talk about this green plant you hear, you see everywhere behind me. It is, well, it's a staple for this time of year. It's a trademark plant for the, the wetlands of Pennsylvania. And it is none other than skunk cabbage. Check this out. Even before Salandine and Spring Beauty, this plant is probably one of the first plants you will ever see in the spring. So much so, it usually shows up in late winter. It's none other than skunk cabbage. Now, this plant has a lot of amazing characteristics, but I gotta say, my favorite one by far is the fact that it is a thermogenic plant. That basically means that its, it's roots and underground structures will actually produce their own heat and warm the plant up in order to melt snow on the ground above. That allows the plant to produce leaves and capitalize on the earliest possible sunlight for the growing season. It pretty much gives it a jump start ahead of all the other plants. What I also love about this plant is the same time I see this happening is generally the same time I see the spotted salamanders heading towards their breeding grounds. So get this, skunk cabbage is a natural laxative and a rather potent one at that. And so much so that when bears go into hibernating, they have to form this plug in their GI tracts so they don't soil themselves in their sleep, right? That's pretty important. Um, well, after a while, they come out of hibernating and they really got to do their business, but they can't. It could be rather difficult. So what they do is they search around for skunk cabbage. Mind you, it's the end of winter, so, you know, the leaves are going to be small. They're not going to be that big, not nearly as big as these ones here. And they're going to eat a whole bunch of that and it works its magic and pretty much opens the doors, you know, if you catch my drift. Maybe that's one of the reasons why they wake up so cranky is because they're like, oh, I gotta go and I can't. But the other reason is, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I'm pretty cranky myself. So, um, interesting thing is, is when skunk cabbage gets a little older, when those leaves start to get a little bit bigger, they develop a lot of calcium oxalate crystals. And eating them at that stage is like swallowing a whole bunch of broken glass and pins. I know firsthand. Uh, it was a little bit too old. And uh, I wonder if bears are affected by that. But no, right, they're coming out of winter. It's going to be a whole bunch of baby skunk cabbage before those crystals develop. Interesting, huh? And that leads me to another rather entertaining fact about skunk cabbage. You see, it is rumored that back in the day, when certain Native American villages and stuff were invaded by either warring nations or Europeans or whatnot, well, of course, they would leave their villages in a hurry. That means there would often still be food like soups and stews cooking at the fires. You know, they had that forever stew where it's just always going. And, uh, well, naturally, the invaders would be enjoying the spoils of war. They'd look over and see those fires and be like, ooh, we got some food. Well, what do you want to do? Let's eat. And, uh, well, that's where the real cunning would, would kick in. Because little did they know, those villagers would often spike their soups and stews before they would flee with skunk cabbage. One thing would lead to another, and later on in the evening, the invaders would probably be rolling around holding their guts because they're in pain and, well, you know, losing their, their bowels or running off into the woods to relieve themselves. And that is when the villagers would come back and reclaim their village. You know, they would strike that fatal blow while the enemy is down, quite literally, and, and take their village back. I mean, how cool is that? 
It's so smart, you know, you plan a few steps ahead, that's how you win the battle, and knowing is half the battle. So I'm probably going to talk a little more about plants in this video than I do invertebrates and wildlife, simply because I feel that plants are often neglected when it comes to nature and wildlife videos on YouTube. I mean, there's plenty of videos showing the beauty of flowers, and I wholeheartedly agree. But I actually find plants to be a lot more exciting and impressive than just being pretty things to look at. Take dandelions, for example. How many of you know dandelions pretty much produce a gas that encourages the overall even ripening of fruit crops, especially apples? That's why when you're driving past an apple orchard, you'll probably notice thousands of dandelions beneath the trees. That, and it's a lot of work to remove them. Not only are dandelions rather beautiful to look at and important crops for pollinators, they also, as you probably already know, have many medicinal and culinary uses. They're famous for their high iron content and other vitamins and minerals, but they're a wonderful addition to salads, especially the unopened blossoms, in my opinion. I myself personally make a delicious dandelion vinegar every spring to enjoy throughout the entire year. And I love it. Now, dandelion obviously gets its name from the appearance of its leaves, basically the dent of a lion. They resemble lion's teeth. If you look at the leaf, you can, you can kind of see that. This tiny little flower is corn speedwell, and it's actually in the plantain family. Uh, it gets its name because people often used it for treating various conditions, but mainly for skin infections and burns and things like that. You would just simply bruise the leaves and apply them directly to the wound. It obviously gets its name Speedwell because it helped speed up the rapid healing of said ailments. Of course, nothing quite claims spring until you're walking through a forest and seeing the ground completely saturated with those beautiful five-petaled white flowers with the pink stripes. And of course, I'm talking about none other than the wonderful spring beauty. Not a year passes where I don't enjoy every part of this plant in the kitchen. I don't know what part I like best about spring beauty. I mean, I love to take the entire above-ground plant and mix it in with my salads of other wild edibles with a splash of dandelion vinegar to really celebrate the spring season with open arms. But there's nothing quite like the, the roots of the spring beauty. I mean, they're delicious both raw and cooked, and I find them to taste a little bit like a cross between red potatoes and chestnuts, but that's just my opinion. Simmer them up with a touch of butter and I'm in heaven. During the period where spring beauties are photosynthesizing, the underground corms will be storing energy for next spring's development of, well, the whole plant. The corm sends up only one leaf if no flowers are to be formed for the growing season. If it intends to produce flowers, it'll send up two leaves in order to photosynthesize enough food to produce flowers. Spring beauties actually form their flower buds in the fall, and they overwinter beneath the leaf litter. Okay, so check this out. Right before me is lesser salandine, and people often refer to this flower as buttercups. Now, it's not really that the true quintessential buttercup, but they are in a buttercup family. And there's a pretty cool thing about the buttercup family. Check this out. Of course, buttercups are pretty much always associated with spring and in the shining sunlight but there are many members of the buttercup family. This flower here is often referred to as, you know, your traditional buttercups, but it's actually lesser salandine, still in the family, however. Now, a cool thing about buttercups is the fact that on May Day, farmers would often rub buttercups on the udders of cows to, one, help ensure successful milk production, but the main goal was actually to prevent the seed, or fairies, from 
pretty much stealing our cattle in order to hybridize them with their own cattle. Now my favorite folklore associated with buttercups is that it was believed that swallows would often eat buttercups in order to give their offspring prophetic abilities and clear sight. I think that one's pretty cool. This is another early spring bloom and it's called trout lily. It's always a welcome sight because it's one of the brightest things in the landscape this time of year. Something I find pretty interesting about these blooms is they're usually kind of nodding down towards the ground and that makes me wonder if they are intending to have some of the digger bees or early bumblebees as pollinators. You know, because they're not the most graceful flyers and they're often close to the ground so they can go up into the blossom. But I'm just speculating. Aside from the beauty of this flower, I really like those mottled leaves. Those brown patches can sometimes be kind of purple and the way it's diffused around the edges often reminds me of like leaf shadows and stuff on the plant. It's kind of like got its own built-in shadows. I wonder if that helps it absorb heat from the sun in order to help the plant develop faster. Again, I'm just speculating. Okay, so there's a bicycle trail that comes right through the edge of this wetlands and there's a couple of damaged skunk cabbage right over there. And that allows me to show you this plant a little closer. I'm sure you can assume how skunk cabbage got its name. If you tear these leaves, you can't smell this, but it smells identical to a skunk. Like, a little bit like a roadkill skunk, freshly roadkill. I mean, they're, they're not joking. It smells just like skunk. And of course, skunk cabbage. Easy to put that one together, isn't it? Okay, so it's getting a little bit late in the day and I still have a few errands to run. So I'm gonna wrap this video up. I know I didn't film any animals in this video, but you know, plants are cool, right? There's tons of things to talk about and discover in nature no matter where you look and what you take an interest in. And I wanna thank you for watching this video and hope you check out some of my other videos. I've got some really good spring foraging videos and medicinal plant videos too. So once again, I'm Chris Ignato, signing out.